Today I'll be talking about uh, using natural variation in tomatoes to find new sources of disease resistance. Pseudomonas syringae pathophar tomato, or PST for short, causes bacterial speck disease. It causes necrotic specks on leaves, stems, flowers, and fruits that often prevent growers from being able to market their produce. Most people would not buy this tomato. It can also reduce yield due to loss of area on photosynthetic area on leaves. This can lead to serious economic impacts on growers. Previously, Pseudomonas syringae has been kept under, path, has been kept under control using race zero, uh, well, race zero strains of PST have been kept under control using uh, strains of plant with PTO, with the gene PTO. The gene encoded by PTO recognizes the presence of AVR PTO and AVR PTO B in race zero strains and activates the immune response. Uh, recently, race one strains have started becoming more common. R race one strains are not detected by PTO proteins and therefore avoid the immune responses associated with them. Therefore, we need to find new immune responses to address the rise of these new uh, strains of PST. Additionally, the PST tomato pathosystem serves as a great model for plant pathogen interactions, and any findings may be applicable to other uh, plant pathogen systems. This summer, I used natural variation in tomato and its closest wild relative, Solanum pimpinol folium, to characterize new sources of resistance. Tomato as a crop already has a relatively large amount of variation compared to other crops. Additionally, S. pimpinol folium has an even wider pool of variation compared to tomatoes. Natural variation is a powerful tool for finding beneficial new traits because cultivated varieties are selected for different traits than wild varieties. Cultivated varieties had been selected for taste and yield, and wild varieties tend to be selected for fitness, which includes, among other things, uh, path, uh, pathogen resistance. Plant immune responses, uh, that's a small visual bug by Excel. Uh, please ignore that. Plant immune responses have two pathways through which they function. There is pattern-triggered immunity, or PTI, and effector-triggered immunity, or e ETI. PTI is the first line of defense where transmembrane proteins detect the presence of pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs for short. These include things like flagellum or uh, cold shock protein. PTI responses are numerous and can be broadly applicable across pathogens, but they are only moderate in the strength of their response. Bacteria have evolved to bypass PTI systems using proteins called effectors. Effectors interfere with PTI proteins and, re and bypass the immune response. Plants, in turn, have a secondary line of defense, ETI. ETI detects these effectors and act leads to a very specific and strong response, usually involving localized programmed cell death. This keeps the pathogen from spreading. This is an example of PTI using the protein FLS3. First, the leucine-rich repeat region of the protein detects the, uh, <laughs> detects the flag 228 peptide of the bacteria's flagellum. This triggers a few proteins. MAP3K, which goes on to activate a defense signaling cascade, and BAC1, which goes on to activate NADPH oxidases, which then produce reactive oxygen species, or ROS for short, such as hydrogen peroxide. Reactive oxygen species both act directly on the pathogen and also signal other defense reactions. In my project, I examined four PTI receptors, FLS2.1, FLS2.2, FLS3, and CORE. 
Due to a gene duplication event, FLS 2.1 and 2.2 both detect FLAG22. FLS3 detects FLAG228. Both FLAG22 and FLAG228 are uh, peptides involved in making up flagellin. CORE detects CSP22, or cold shock protein. From now on out, I'll focus primarily on FLS3 for the sake of time, although I did screen the other uh, four, well, other three uh, proteins. We identified natural variants of tomato that have single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, within the protein's coding regions of DNA that lead to amino acid changes. My project was to systematically screen accessions using ROS assays to determine whether they have strong, average, weak, or no responses to the PAMP. My hypothesis is that we will identify uh, accessions with differential responses uh, to each PAMP. And of particular interest are ones with strong responses because these can be bred into, to into tomato lines and increase resistance, or no responses, because although these can be bred into cultivars, they will help us understand the pathway, the pathways and the proteins function. So to figure out which variants to screen, a variant relatedness tree was constructed by Dr. Adrian Powell for each gene to help us choose accessions to screen. We sampled accessions from each cluster and grew them for four weeks. Start accessions were ones that I tested during this round of screening. I sampled leaf discs from these plants and placed them in a 96 well plate and let them sit in water overnight. I removed the water and added a solution of horseradish peroxidase, luminol, and whichever PAMP I was screening for. The plates were then immediately placed into a 96 well plate reader and the ROS assay began. As to how ROS assays work on a molecular level, horseradish peroxidase reacts with reactive oxygen species to catalyze luminol, which then produces luminescence proportionate to the amount of reactive oxygen species in solution. These emissions are then measured over a 45 minute time frame and used to gauge the reactivity towards the PAMP. Uh, the reactive oxygen species came from the PTI reactions. Uh, this is an example of what a raw output from the plate reader looks like. I need to go through and determine where errors may have occurred and discard those wells from the data, like this column. Uh, I'll talk about that later in questions. Uh, for each one of these curves, is a graph of the luminescence over time, which is measured in relative light units. For controls, I used at least two controls per, uh, per PAMP, per plate. Uh, I have a positive control, which is Rio Grande PTOR, which is the positive average. I have EA01356, for the high control, this one was previously identified in the screen. I have a FLS3 CRISPR knockout for my first negative control. And I have CR149 for my second negative control. It was also previously identified in the screen to have no response to flag 228. And it has a strong response to flag 22. Here's a graph with just the controls on it for now. Uh, accessions were judged by their relation to PTOR, which is this black line. Accessions above PTOR, such as our high control, were judged as high. Accessions equal to it were judged as positive. Accessions below were judged as weak responders, and accessions equal to the negative controls were judged as negative. Now I'll add on my controls. A majority of the controls were negative or low responders, so we have our first negative negative, negative. This one is also a negative. We have a weak response, another weak response, and then a last weak response. Here's the data summarized in a table. The most interesting accessions are LA0373, 
because it had a negative response to both flag 22 and flag 228, which might indicate that it has a mutation in a protein in the pathway that is for both uh, flag uh, FLS3 and FLS2.1 or 2.2. Uh, we have uh, PI126947, which had a curve that plateaued, which could indicate a sustained response to the PAMP. And we had LA1511, which responded differently in this screen than in other screens, so it's worth looking into. Additionally, we had the previously identified accession CR149, which ha has a strong response to flag 22 and a weak response, uh, and no response to flag 228, and EA01356 with its strong response. The next step for this project is to take the accessions that have been identified as interesting by my screen and do further investigation into their identified SNPs. Checking the impact of the individual amino acid changes through transient expression in mutated genes in N. benthamiana will help us identify which SNPs may be responsible for these changes in phenotype. But if the individual SNPs do not seem to affect the phenotype, it is possible that something downstream could be in the pathways could be responsible for this. We could also use CRISPR in, to develop mutants in native accessions. And finally, we could do hybrid crosses, which I am currently doing right now. Uh, uh, special thanks to uh, Dr. Dr. Robin Roberts for uh, working with me as my mentor. It, they said it was Sammy Marinero, but it's, yeah. Uh, thanks to Dr. Greg Martin and the rest of the Martin Lab for welcoming me into their lab. And uh, thanks to the UROC program back at my school for giving me funding and professional development support. And funding was provided by NSF for both this program and my project. And through my school, I received a grant from the US Department of Education to be here. Uh, I have a bit of time left. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, we also screened other, uh, other receptors. So FLS3 was the one that we picked, but other receptors did, have, did show responses that were sh much stronger than, than PTOR, such as uh, we, we had a new strong responder in core. Uh, I just picked FLS3 because it's kind of the newer one. Yes. Mm, yes. <laughs> I, I, I haven't done those screens myself, but yeah. What did you see from the other persons that you screened? Did you see similar results to this with a lot of the uh, low responders? Yeah, we did have a lot of low and negative responders because turns out PTOR is actually a pretty good uh, it's pretty resistant to everything already. So it's, it's rarer to find things that are more resistant than it. So uh, I found pr pretty much every, every receptor had just a one or two high responders, maybe a few average responders, and a large amount of low to negative responders. Okay, thank you.